So we'll get started in about another minute or two. Are we, are we live? Live. We're live, right. So welcome to today's Active Teaching Lab. A few people come in. You know, also there in the corner. So welcome to the Active Teaching Lab. Uh, today we're going to talk about, I think, a two-pronged subject. The first is personalized learning, and then the second prong that is connecting the students to opportunities for personalized learning. Uh, so maybe it's a pretty vast topic, so hopefully we can narrow it down um, in a few ways. In front of you, um, on the tables, you have a few pieces of information in front of you. Um, the first is the schedule for the rest of the semester, so March through May. Uh, it shows the labs and the topics that we have um, coming up. You also have a copy of today's activity sheet, the paper version. At the top of this sheet, you have the Canvas course URL, which if you can Log in, you can participate and contribute to the digital version of, the act uh, of this activity sheet. Obviously, the links to this page are indeed not active. Uh, so logging into that, taking notes, sharing resources on the activity sheet is a great way for all of us to continue the conversation, but also as a way to create a resource bank um, for everyone else. And then finally, we have uh, the purple sheet. Uh, so at the end of today's lab, let's get out, send out a few comments. How is this lab helpful for you? What would you like to see in the future? Um, and any additional comments that you have? Uh, about the lab, and that would be very uh, helpful for us. Um, do we have any first timers today? Awesome. Jen and Libby. And Allison. I wrote it the map, but I wrote it last week. Awesome. I'll get you one. <laughs> <laughs> Did you write me the same time? Mine's probably right there. So the way we're going to sort of run um, today's lab, I'd like to start off since we're a little bit of a small group, we start off with some more personal introductions. So your name, the department, or unit that you're from, and also what you would like to leave here with today. So what are some of the questions and goals that you have for your own learning um, on the topic of personalized learning and connecting students to that? Um, and if possible, please contribute and collaborate on the digital activity sheet with any resources uh, that you can share. But before we get to that, there is one announcement that I would like to make from a colleague of ours, Karen Skiba, um, who's sent out the call for applications for the Teach Online at UW program. Um, we'll put a, the active link to this in our activity sheet. Um, and so the, the application is coming up sort of the end of April 2020 or sooner if possible for summer planning and designing and getting involved um, in that. So if you're interested in that, um, the, the URL is topteachonline.wisc.com. Um, EDU. If we could start, Molly, could we start with you to introduce yourself? What brings you to today? Uh, I'm Molly. I'm a postdoc in the Department of Psychology. And we are working on projects to try to get research out to people who are less familiar with the research, and so teachers, parents, that kind of thing. And so everybody's coming with a different background and okay. wanting to work on personalizing. Okay. 
Kenny. Uh, my name is Kenny. I'm a graduate student in the kinesiology department, um, and just here to listen mostly, um, kind of try to pick up on what other people are doing. Is there any personalized learning going on in the kinesiology department? Um, I mean, looking through uh, the activity sheet, um, I'm kind of picking out stuff that has been done in my own classes or classes I've worked with. Okay. So um, it's certainly there, but I'm just curious what other people are doing. Okay. AJ. Yeah, hi, I'm AJ Dowtree Krill. I work in Druid with AT with a high school program called ITA, mm -hmm. college here on campus. And, um, so I actually lead with our high school students a couple of different forms of independent project work curriculum. So I'm very interested in this topic and I think I'm gonna to try to reflect on what I'm what I'm doing that's working and what I'm doing that I haven't tried or isn't working. Okay. Sounds good. Great. All right. Um, I work here at uh, Bob and Bob and Bob and Sciences. Okay. I teach a introductory machine course to the Bobby Graduate Health Law. Okay. And I am looking for ideas to visualize content and get meet the learning objective that has the skills more for the data. So my goals are solid, so there are specific tasks that I want to do. And how about how many students do you have per semester? This semester, 100. Okay. It's a small class. Okay. <laughs> But I'm also I think it's twice in the evening. Otherwise, I can have studies for six weeks. Actually, I want to just move that to campus and run a structure and then create up this as well. Okay. 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 Uh, two things that I'm interested in this topic is one, having students take agency for their learning, for personalizing their learning, so that we don't have to figure out how to personalize for 100 different students that we've never met before, because um, it gets hard. And then the other one is how we build in flexibility in our courses to be able to sort of allow for that process of searching and connecting to content that makes sense to lots of students. Jen. Hi, I'm Jen Sell, and I'm a workplace English language instructor housed in the Cultural Linguistic Services Unit in the Office of Human Resources. My, thank you. Um, my students are actually employees working here who come from different language backgrounds, and our courses are English classes. Um, we do a lot of personalization because our, like, not our group is so diverse. Um, we try to lead to do that, and effective language learning is especially important. The challenge we have is we have very little time to do. Uh -huh. um, How much time? Um, we work with them uh, twice a week for 12 weeks for an hour. Um, so we already do things like assign communication activities. So um, students typically learn in the class, language skills, and then they go practice them and go and do the first two classes. So we try to do things like that, but that doesn't necessarily personalize their own ability levels. Um, I'm an occupational science PhD, and I'm a TA in the occupational therapy program for our research courses. Um, and we're just always looking for ways to increase engagement around a topic that is not necessarily a peak interest. Okay. Well, uh, 
hi, I'm in English. I'm an assistant, uh, teaching assistant. Uh, a lot of the courses that I teach are uh, those that they have to take. Mm -hmm. So with me, it's kind of like striking a balance between uh, kind of uh, uh, cookie cutter rubrics and instructions and individual variability and freedom. I like that cookie cutter as well. <laughs> Great. Uh, my name is Gordon Shapar, and I'm an instructional designer with Blue X Technology. So um, I'm still new to campus, new employee here. This is the state recently, so middle of winter. <laughs> I, I did it. <laughs> um, I'm just here to learn that, um, what topics and questions people have and to synthesize them here. Hopefully help them sure. Awesome. Yeah, so I work in the veterinary medicine curriculum. Yeah. And um, I also work teaching the student. I work teaching them in their core years where they get a large load of material that we expect them to memorize and then they have to get it. And then I work with them their final year when they are doing more clinical work too. And um, I think in an event, in an, so when I come in the first year, the first semester, in the event to try to support them as much as possible because it is a large amount of information, they get very handheld mm -hmm. and very structured in my life. And I'm trying to figure out how to get them more motivated. Their senior year, they're so used to being fed, they don't not they're not all good at figuring out how to go look for the information or how to <coughs> access something in a way that will help them. Um, and so I'm trying to figure out how to, how to stop leaving them. Yeah, <laughs> stop yeah. them wanting to. They're so used to being led, and I don't know how to like turn them around and say, like, there's another way that this doesn't have to be this way. And you will have to go out and not tell patients, so please learn to make yourself up. Hopefully, we'll be fine. I can imagine pulling this out. I did the same thing. I'm not alone. Angelica, uh, structural staff, I teach a senior level capstone course where students get sort of a research like experience. And most of the students have, thank you, mm -hmm. have not had any research experience. Um, and so we do a lot of stuff in the class to try to get at that. But I guess I'm kind of at a thinking about personalized or maybe more individualized learning um, because I teach a biochemistry course. but not a biochemistry in the biochemistry department. So all my students are chemistry and biology, which are different. Um, and so finding ways to like provide that extra maybe content or resources to help each student kind of need might need that extra information so we're not spending too much time covering like how proteins are targeted in a cell. Sort of as a remedial resource or kind a review of, resource. Maybe kind of review or maybe like so some students may be review and some might be like, oh, this is a topic, it would be helpful to at least have an idea of it if you never heard it before. So sure. I guess it's more of an individualized or different, I don't know what category that is. I don't think it's personalized mm -hmm. per se. Um, well, I, think maybe, it's a, I mean, I always think it's a very broad mix. term. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, that's what I'm thinking about. Yeah. Um, so yeah, sort of, um, what do you call that? Self-directed? Self-directed or like, um, there's a term for like points of Nebulous self generated learning yeah. ability. So you could say like catch up, maybe catch up material or like yeah. that kind of stuff. Awesome. And then I don't remember if I introduced myself. Um, for those that came in, my name is JT, and I work in Intuit with AT as well. I'm also a PhD candidate in the Department of French and Italian. Um, and I'm really blown away by the question of scale with personalized learning. Um, I don't know about 150 students in a classroom. How, I think Eric, you brought that up. How do you make that so each individual student? Um, can sort of find their own niche, similar to the same question that you're raising as well. So that's sort of um, where I'm going from with this. Um, but I, since we have a lot of new India, uh, new participants as well as um, our returners, I'd like for you to discuss with your new table these three similar questions just to kind of get the ball rolling. 
And then we're going to get back to these questions and concerns that we have to sort of generate a little bit more campus connections and a little, little bit more topic. So this first is sort of what are your experiences with personalized learning? I think you sort of already um, answered these in your introductions. Um, and but some instances, or in some instances, does your department offer any customization? As a graduate student, I'm required to have a PhD minor, which can be distributed, so it's kind of made the way that I see fit fit my own research profile and research interests. Um, so that's a, a way that I, of course, so also can come to that. And also, are there any features of Canvas or any other types of programs, maybe H5P plus books for you, Angela, um, that can offer that personalized um, sort of mastery path connection that you might that you're not unaware of or you think might be useful for further exploration. So maybe take five or six minutes, go through these questions, make a new friend, and uh, we'll come back in a few minutes.
Conversations are turning around the question of how do you get students to actually want to do something more than what we're forcing them to do. So to break out of that cookie cutter mold, but also in your case, um, Jen, sort of encouraging them to pursue their own personal goals for language learning, for example. And to me, at least, sort of listening to a lot of your conversations, they start with a very simple question or some simple gesture ask, or is you just ask the student what is it they want to do which is easier said than done, right? When you have students who don't know what they want or what they want to do either immediately or in 10 years. Um, you know, I think a lot of us don't realize that. <laughs> but if we ask students what to do, let's just play the hypothetical, and they give you an answer. What are some easy examples of ways you could customize, I don't want to say customize the experience because it's not really buying a car in a classroom, but what are some sort of easy ways that even in a class of 150 individuals or even more, or 10, that you could personalize their access and experience with course content? One easy one that comes to mind for me is student carried content. So for example, when I'm thinking of it this way from the perspective of a graduate student where everyone is collaborating to create a combined bibliography for a course. So, so students pursue their own research interests in a way, so wherever their paths may be, but towards the end of the semester, you lead with a research guide. So imagine you have a topic on 19th century French literature, there's a thousand different options, but everyone's not necessarily interested in the same thing, but you're coming together. And Angela, you mentioned in your discussion, you have experience with a lot of high school students working independently and then presenting in the end. Yeah, essentially the students, so it was a professional level biology course, and so it was for one high school, they do all personalized learning, and I'm like, it's not a high school learning, it's all great, um, but the, the teacher would sort of cover a new topic and go over some basics, but then the students were invited to sort of pick a topic within that bigger umbrella and kind of get a little more in-depth and then create something to share back with the group, and then the something could be like, a short video that you make on your tablet or media poster, so it can be either digital or physical media. And then they got a chance to kind of go through it to teach each other. So that was yeah. 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 just sort of the share that experience. So if we make it maybe a half step harder than asking students to find a thousand different images or videos that represent course content, 
or how they feel about post content, how could we get to something that's a little bit harder? What would be another example do you think? Either completely unrealistic or maybe it's realistic, we just haven't figured it out. Allison, what do you think? I don't feel like I know the answer to your question. Well, <laughs> that's cool too. But what would personalization look like? What would be an example of, in your instance, of how personalized, how you connect students to their own personal content? I mean, sometimes I have a, a small model. I got our um, facilitator to mock up for me online portal okay. that through Paul Tricks, where they've all kind of looked at the same clinical case and they've come, they kind of try to figure out what the most likely problems this patient has are. And then I say, okay, I will give you two additional tests you can run on this patient. Okay. And there's a big list, and they can choose whichever two they want. They might not be helpful information. They might get helpful information. Um, and then we talk about it as a group afterward. They all choose different ones. We talk about why did you choose which ones, and actually which ones would have really gotten to the core to split between your major differentials. Sure. So, so then at least it gives them some autonomy to do something that exactly. I don't force them to do. Yeah. But also I would say maybe in this example, it's maybe a case study mm -hmm. where they're each pick, 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 picking a path they think is appropriate, but in the end, they're still coming back and sharing that experience, whether it's they went down the wrong path or they went down the right path, maybe for different reasons. Other examples of personalized learning that you could envision in a course that you teach, either, either scalable, not scalable, reasonable, unreasonable? Eric, you said you have 150 students in your course. Do you think... What could a personalized learning experience look like in nutritional sciences? Well, actually, John had that idea that we have been doing for decades that students, uh, part of the uh, objective for the course is they uh, understand uh, what nutrients they need. So mm -hmm. they go their own diet, they analyze their own diet, um, they compare their own diet to that guideline, and they compare their own diet to the and ask them to be flat. Um, the good and bad of having those guys be standards. I think that's a problem. What do you think? So, what, do, you, what is, do you think that's what's hard about that? I, so, so that, I was like, oh, you have diet, right? And like, yes, but they've been doing it for decades. They're tired of that. <laughs> You know, how do we, is there anything new for that? And I think that that's, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful way to say, huh, we're already doing personalized content all the time. Nutrition, it's very personal, right? And everybody has their own sorts of, um, I don't want to call it fetish interests, but like, <laughs> oh, interest like, oh, I want to do the no sugar thing. So I'm going to look at no sugar. I'm going to do gluten free. So I'm going to look at that. So there's all of these things. but. Is there something like if you've already been doing that forever? What what do you do now? They're, they're tired of it. You never ask them. Well, actually, uh, one of the huge challenges is there's no shortage of students. And one of the problems is that that those stuff that you guidelines are just guidelines and not standards. So I think part of the challenge is how do we, in the end, accomplish the learning objective because we can have a very extensive discussion and still every student gets something different out of it. Mm -hmm. Some of the more uh, obsessive ones, <laughs> compulsive ones, that they don't get the message. They reinforce what they have been doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. along the way, and that's the part that I, I'm so worried about when I start giving them personalized content, because they will get something totally different from what I want them to get out of, which is to treat the subject more academically, and treat it as a science, and approach it uh, with an open mind. Yeah, I don't know if this is helpful, but uh, so part of what I do is sort of related to the medical school education for sure my students, and so they have they do case studies in their curriculum now, which has been new for a couple of years. But they do this really interesting thing where they break out into small groups, and they're given sort of the case at the beginning of the week. And then they, their first step is they actually have to determine what learning objectives they need to kind of recover 
just like following the case or essentially to, to give recommendations to the patient. So there could be a way to like sneak in your learning objectives or you know have the students maybe come up with the learning objectives that are your learning objectives. But then if your learning objective is, you know, realizing there's flexibility, you know, coming up with those kinds of things, but having them tell it to you and then build that into the knowledge they're gonna go out and find that might be a way to kind of get into that. So they're still doing the personalized part of like figuring out how to reach that objective, but they also had to like either be told or figure out what that objective is too, and that might help kind of guide them back to a place that you want them to end up. Because yeah, you know, if they're stabbing out in all different directions, they could go down a path that's just not helpful for, you know, getting to where they need to be. So that might be a way to you know, add that in somehow. But is it, are they the case-based studies that they're doing, or is it just Right. Right. They always have a facilitator in each of these rooms to help, like, if they're getting too far over here, and actually, let's say anything about this, it's hard to kind of bring them back. So the group work could follow up in a personalized group work. So we have tried to break it into a small group, and we ended up a day of harmony. <laughs> Work for you, up, right? Uh, well, for them too. Well, yes, both. And, uh, and, uh, and it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of tricky. It's kind of tricky. Um, uh, we'll have to kind of scale up when we have to get to the next guest still. That's why I'm worried about sneaking. Yeah, 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 fair enough. <laughs> Do you think it would be helpful if you shared that sort of rubric with them before they venture out on their own journey and say this is, you know, the, I want to say the A of the course is the sort of shift in culture, shift in mindset, and that, do you think that would still be a surprise, or? Yeah, um, still in my mind, to with that differently, just depends on what they would receive. And I think uh, part of the barrier for me is there's only that much time I want to spend on the course. Mm -hmm. and that's always become a barrier because uh, sometimes I really shift it so that I hear it. Sometimes I think I, I, if I, if I think, think there's going to be an ingrained mind mindset, mindset and then some and then groups some are going to be somewhere to come with, I try, I try to, to open whatever we're, we're going to talk about, about with, with um, um, like, like an example, example that there's, there's clearly, clearly like, like I said it up and they're like, oh, oh clearly this is what's going to happen. happen. And they're like, oh, oh no, and we were wrong too. too. We thought the same thing, and that's what we were wrong. We should have made these assumptions and they have so, so if you can find a horrible example, you can have like, like this, this bias thing that this person was in the eating fries in their entire life, life. It probably is bad. <laughs> um, you know, like whatever, whatever it was, this was this, this, this was not on, was, was not appropriate or, or wasn't good, good. And then and I thought about well, maybe I needed to be more or my mind. And there's maybe more variety than ever. Sometimes that have helped me in the somehow. Or even taking something that they, they, they come obsessive about or, or come in about already obsessing about and saying, okay, your job, personal learning, take whatever that is, go find, go build the case against, against yourself. And that way you can, you know, force them to do the research. It's still on the topic that they choose, but when you can even say, hey, this is to make the argument topic better, but as they do that, if they do it well, they'll find that they should be so sure. And, and you're having a very interesting question that you raised about the time. Do you, for I guess for the and uh, Ginger already never had stuff. <laughs> Why are you running out of here? Well, that's the tricky. Yeah. 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 It's so interesting because I've got a lot of different ideas like for like personalized like structure for a type of language class. But I just don't have the time to do that. Um, so, so then I think it was like really thing initially, John, this idea of how can we build in ways for the learners to be charged 
like these are partners in the process of personalizing mm -hmm. themselves. So trying to come up with that I mean, this is just an obvious one, but in our language courses, we, we have um, individual vocabulary notebooks that they then fill in the vocabulary that's most relevant to their position. Yeah. But they, they still they need to be people that are doing that rather than me trying to create a word bank that's going to fit with everybody's needs to sure. personalize it. So trying to help people understand that this is what we hope that also would be good. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I was just thinking about the time thing. So, um, so, so your first question when we were doing a table talk was, uh -huh. uh, I, I thought of that as my own experience for the and the And I'm curious for other people, just um, as a small person, like, like all the chances I've had to do with them in this work are very vivid in my mind. Um, and I come, come back to same, same questions, questions like, 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 like one, one of them was just like how do you work music and I'm always coming back to that. And so I'm just curious, like, and I, I admittedly don't really understand the start and end to courses, like, I want to learn, so you know, I'm going to keep learning after the course. So I'm just curious, like, for, for people's experience, having a chance to take up something independently and doing it first in like, their own way, mm -hmm. um, I suspect it's very personality dependent. Mm -hmm. I am a very like, as all of the insanely typing people in medical are, like, I don't want to like, like, I don't want to enjoy it. I just want to achieve the objective because I got other stuff on my plate. So like. Put the poop and acronym poop in front of me, and I'll jump through it like the train I'm gonna feel that I am. But like, I don't want to like explore the possibilities. Like, I just want to do what you need me to do. Mm -hmm. um, you and to discover your own poop. I like. I don't want to know there's multiple hoops even. <laughs> like, there should not be no existence of other hoops. And I recognize the like flaw in that and how it limits me. But it's like at the end of the day, when I get to work at 5:45 in the morning and I leave at 9 o'clock at night. I don't want any more hoops. <laughs> and I feel like we put our students with this intensive curriculum in the exact same position. Mm -hmm. They don't want to like spread out because they're like, I just I can only deal with what I have in my hands. But sort of related to that, and I do want to get back to your question. I mean, even with 25 students, I mean, do you I'm thinking at the beginning of a semester, you have, I guess, employees from the university or the university or the system that come from different departments and they might have different language needs, right? So maybe perhaps working in a medical department or working in HR, so the vocabulary and the syntax and the lexical items are unique. Do you think maybe asking them at the beginning of the semester, why are you in this course? What are your specific goals for language learning? Because it's not just about you know, your idea of what they need, sort of maybe re-articulating that and allow them to tell you what their objectives are. I think that's sort of similar to what Angela, you mentioned. Do you think that could be a way to help? I do, and we do try to do that to some extent. We actually have the luxury of we meet one on one with every student for a half an hour um, before the course, and it's balancing what we hear from them with the other what we call stakeholders, which would be the people who are kind enough to allow them to do the classes on their shifts right. and really want you to focus on that workplace language. So sometimes the goals don't necessarily match, but right. at least we're able to figure out ways so we can say, okay. You, you learned how to make a telephone call today so you can call in sick, mm -hmm. and then suggest to them what are ways that you can do this, you know, outside in the, in the real world, yeah. in your lives, if your child's sick, calling to school, et cetera. We can't right. work on that in class, but we can at least maybe open doors to, so that they can figure out how can it be relevant for them in other ways. In your instance, is there any way to move that onto Canvas? Those types of scenarios, uh, or? That's a good question. No, not currently. Okay. Maybe in the works. <laughs> An example of a really hard personalized learning, maybe sort of way too complicated, way too convoluted, but the, um, at the bottom of the digital activity sheet, uh, there's Canvas mastery paths. Um, and that's, on, that's on the digital copy of the, of the sheet. There's also a tool called H5P branching scenarios. Is there anyone that's familiar with Adobe Captivate or Articulate Storyline as a, you want to share? 
Um, <laughs> yeah. I told Molly about it uh, a little while ago. I kind of think of it as a clickable version of a PowerPoint presentation, although that's maybe not so low <laughs> bar. But essentially, you can create a module, a self updating module. Um, you can like post on a web page that uh, learners can interact with. So it might have a welcome screen, and then the, there are clickable buttons. You can you can add clickable buttons that might you know take you to another information. You can add like sound clips, video clips. Uh, so it's pretty much whatever you want. Um, I've used them a couple ways. One is to create, yeah, a very self-contained clickable module where students can actually like choose a path and kind of go down. I mean, that was for medical students, sort of clinical base, where they were given like a patient case, and they could select kind of similarly like what labs they wanted to see next, and then they would get yeah, instant feedback. So it was meant to be a move activity where they could like talk through, but also get get the correct answers kind of as they walk through. Um, and then I've also, you can export from these as well to create videos. So I'm creating like a narrated PowerPoint where essentially it's the PowerPoint, but then you can make things appear, disappear, arrows, boxes, and so there's various tools for it. And just to give you an example of one of these tools, and I think this could be relevant for many of the situations that have been described. Um, so for example, this is um, H5P branching scenario. Um, it's an uh, interactive educational resource that you can embed into Pressbooks. Um, a lot of this information is on the activity sheets, so I'm not going to drill down into sort of the nuts and bolts. But just to give you an example of this, so you have, for example, um, the, the, the idea of the course, the topic of the course is just very broad, art of your, you know, what's up? Oh, am I not sharing this video? There we go, we're back. Yeah. There we go. Slowly but surely. So, for example, as I mentioned, sort of have a PowerPoint slide, content, text, etc. You can advance, advance, read at your own pace as you would like. Clicking next. Obviously, you have sort of a self-check question. You know, uh, perhaps an antagonistic emoji. <laughs> Click some art periods, etc. What I'm trying to show you is when it gets to which path do you want next? There you go. And then we have this question: What would you like to do next? And this is a feature that you can build into the branching scenario to not necessarily, you can anticipate the student's interest based on the previous semester, or you can actually invite them to collaborate with you inside of this activity. Um, it is very technically intensive, but it could be a fun project for students who really want to pursue that background. And you have three separate little options for them uh, to pursue in the future. It could be when you go to circle back and learning more about Renaissance, Renaissance artist art as um, a particular genre, or going to jump forward to another period, or just finishing the course. And I think that could be an interesting way to engage students um, into that learning. And it was something that we mentioned, or mentioned at the beginning, sort of that idea of student curated content. So they're generating content. I don't know if it's necessarily more time intensive, Eric. It seems like that was your concern there is how much time are you as the instructor investing. But in this instance, they are creating content and linking it to one another. So by the end of the semester, you have this massive project of student interest in, for example, Westland's art art. Um, it could be something that is immediately applicable to your own um, circumstances, but I just wanted to share that with you. It is very time intensive. Yes, Tom. So if the idea of having a students work together to create something that is authentic and can be used to over and over to save the time and the structure, Back to my morning. <laughs> <laughs> and you might have sort of, your instance, your question or comment earlier about sort of breaking out of that cookie cutter goal. And I just sort of thinking from the academic or the administrative group, right? We have these course titles that must be taught every single semester in and out. But at the same time, these types of interactivity, these are sort of great training of charity content. Maybe make the cookie cutter a little bit more dynamic or a little bit broader or. You know, not, not just a, a circle, circle, something like that. That's what's really important. So I have a question. Yes. Because, because part of the field feels greatly like from a, a, I would have, have to put them time in front, front but then they would exist. Whatever. Um, um, if you're letting <laughs> students create it, what, what level of oversight is there? 
right that's the question, question. Um, um because, because sort of, you know again, again like, like i like, like we're not we're making, making like, like, like so we had an act that you have a lot of came in and from the next and talked about, about, about the students creating very deep insight sites. It's a little page on our website. Um, and they would look at um, gene, for example, a high uh, breast cancer. So something that was had something to do with, with whatever they had uh, personal familial connection to. So really close personal learning. But they also, they also, because it was a published basic thing, 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 to the point of, of we don't want to kill people, people, they had a double check, 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 make sure that everything was perfect about, about that, that and very accurate. accurate. And they took they a lot of pride in it and said that, that if they had just done a paper on it, what are the consequences of doing that? Like, like, do you know what it says? It's a checking whether it was an accurate or not. Because it was out there, they took a lot of care. Um, uh, for, for digital media project, project that we had done now 10 years ago, ago we had yeah, students in biology, one, 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 two, work, work together to create these biology uh, uh, tutorials, um, um, the videos and such, such. And, and they had to teach it. They had, it. had the, the, um, uh, one of the storyboard class professors who you know, you know, class uh, has an interview with them. them. So they took it very seriously, even though they had a great project. But, but they had to get it right. right. You know, you know, the things they had to story, so it wasn't exactly like it was, it was, it was close enough to that for a people to focus on. Yeah, and I think you can uh, make that connection here. Here, you have a group and then one, one source and that that is there and another person in the future. So, so there's like one model for areas of check checking before I think maybe you get that. And they watch after each other. Like, they, 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 in some ways, you're having students keep each other in check. So, I don't know, I think there are ways. But then, then also recognizing right this is project, and they might not get to the very latest research, research show at this point. We haven't talked a lot about that. So that's what they do, like, what kind of material you're objective or flexible. So you have a learner objective that does something using accuracy or, like, something of that nature that could then do something more work for it. And if the project is accurate, so they have to pitch something. And then the other thing, just because I was going to mention, is you know, since you know, they, they are, are say, you have two groups of students working on slightly different things, they, they, they could, but they can help peer review to be like, like, okay, okay, you know, how confident are you? You know, how to check this other project, project and like either so say, say, you know, show, show how it is important or show how it kind of is this thing. For I don't know, like case diagnosis, like, like, you know, how maybe maybe you see what the other other diagnosis is and see the might and like. On that diagnosis or for find by the evidence. That, that so that could be a way to, way to get them to also talk, talk to each other and kind of, of fight about how to fight <laughs> productively <laughs> is their, their right, um, solution solutions they're going with. And then, then yeah, yeah, both folks agree that way might give them, them more so 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 how do so we have done some peer review actually they hate it. Um yeah yeah and part of it and they hate your teaching because the Maybe it's not our fault. We've read this trust from them. them. But like, 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 I don't, I don't want, want to learn the wrong fact. I'm having to agree with the wrong fact. I want the right fact. And I don't trust my class 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 that, that, that gets that to this issue of like professional right, right. and like, and like, like you are not, not, I mean, maybe if you mention it in the system, you're always going to work, work with other people like colleagues, colleagues and like, and like, like you need to be a child with a firm thing that you can So, so being, being able to, to, you know, you know yeah, yeah, not, not trust but verify, right? Like, you have to have that, being able to trust somebody and somebody because you're also doing your own. So, that becomes another learning objective, right? Like, like not only are, and I think it's going to be up to that. They're saying when they look their paper and they have a huge pushback. It was similar to the point where like, you told information, which is fair. Right, right. But there's there's big benefits to this other one. So they had to really go to students and talk about the culture of this kind of learning and why it's important. So it takes work, you know, obviously, but tying it to the professionalism in the first place. And the fact that you're going to work with colleagues is going to be really hard to like. Make it not, not just a thing they, they have to do, do but like this is more important, building life skills. Um, I think we should do it.
I'm just thinking in, in terms of the time investment, in, the time investment in learning new tools, for example, Canvas already has a lot of tools that are already available to you. It helps you get you in the time so that will make things a little bit easier. I'm just thinking here as a notebook or a vocabulary, something as simple, something as simple as not just sharing a Google Doc with you or in all of everyone in the course, just so that they can see what other people are doing as well. So they can find words or phrases, for example, that they're interested in using as well. Um, um, even with student curation and student utility value, or some uh, or case studies, maybe setting this up as a discussion in campus where students are interacting that way with one another, but also sort of, you know, a running list of new scientific articles that they found, new images, new videos that also represent course content. In terms of self utility values and asking students, why are you here? What is it that you're interested in? An anonymous survey that could be easy, but also just messaging with them directly. Um, thinking again of personal journals and um, self-identifying learning objectives, those could um, occur as well or maybe somewhere else. I'm not, not, sort of, uh, not sure how to integrate those necessarily. I can think of campus collaboration. Yeah, which has like a full disclosure of campus, campus discussion. discussion. <laughs> but you can always do things, things like, like um, campus, campus collaboration, or even just how to have a campus and sort of deal your rate rate, like the Google Doc Doc that students have access, access to. to. Um, um, as a place that they can add animation. And even on campus, you can have pages in campus that students are allowed to edit. Um, um, and the revision is through there too. And so that can be a way away of adding adding shared shared resources on all C. Um, it's a little it's less, less than like making like a post, but you, you still have the ability to add it to. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Little sheets, little doc doc and then it's a way to collaborate. So, just looking at the clock and the list that we have, I think we've made some pretty good headway in terms of topics that you would like to address. Um, in terms of course requirements of getting around the cookie cutter mold, uh, which is a nagging problem. Um, the question of agency and them deciding can be a rabbit hole because everyone is different. We have 500 students. How are you the instructor and the TAs going to manage that? But hopefully there are sort of more scalable solutions um, that are available for that. Um, some ideas for how to integrate this into Canvas and textbooks. I think a lot of these are also on the activity sheet. So I don't want to get into the nuts and bolts um, of that. But I do. I, I would like to go up here to the learning analytics and figure out how that can get um, to more personalized content and personalized learning. Don, do you have a question? Um, just, just for a I added the link to the bottom of the digital learning. For the student created websites and student created videos. So, if you want to see what has actually happened here on campus, what other people on campus have done, you've got to do that. And so thinking of that learning analytics sort of based on how students are performing in the course, in either currently or maybe in the past, and tailoring resources and experiences for them, either for remediation or for review, or maybe even jumping ahead, like in this example. You know everything there is to know about art in Western Europe, so just finish the course, you're done for the day. Um, all right, would you mind, you, as the learning analytics hat that you're wearing today, maybe some insight into what's going on with, on the campus level for that? Not on the campus level. So individual instructors have experimented with um, individualized learning and personalized approaches. Um, um, the math is not at the end. This is one way. Mm -hmm. um, I know a few instructors that have, have done that. You basically have a way of controlling the use of the content, but um, it can be, and this is from about a year ago, the instructor that I was not collaborating, but just keeping in touch with how was this project going. He had technical challenges. With it not always releasing even when all of the triggers have been met. Mm -hmm. But it's a nice idea if it works better um, than it did a year ago. Um, all of the ideas that you all have come up with. Um, we do have a couple of use cases on the webinar toolkit um, like that come to mind. One example was um, an instructor was trying to do some TA training to make sure that the TAs were all able to support their students the same way. And some of the TAs had a tremendous amount of experience and some were brand new. So she basically set up two different modules and they could self-select. Mm -hmm. um, but again, that's something that's really being assessed as to the content that she's providing that she built depending on who her audience was. Sure. So the assessment piece is, I think, where it gets a little more complex sometimes. And um, 
I love the branch you sang um, as, as a former online course builder and instructional designer because using some of those tools that I took you with integrating with Canvas. So if you're thinking about assessment and if you need to report to a you can talk to somebody and make sure that everything is talked about it. But mostly it's not being integrated. Can I just mention something about? Uh, Individualized learning, differentiated learning, and personalized learning. It's on the, the, the bottom of the first page of your activity sheet, but how many of you remember watching the first new remake of Star Trek, the one where Spock's a little kid? Remember Spock in school? He was in these little gnome dishes, and all these things were flashing in front of his face, and he was like paying attention. Great example of individualized learning, where it's the pace of the content's already there. But it's the pace of how fast can the images flash for me to get it. Versus, I don't know, think about a walkabout where a person wanders out as a child into the, the wilderness and discovers things about themselves and then comes back and has that as the basis. That would be sort of much more personalized learning um, where they find out what they want <coughs> to them. And I think that in some schools, like uh, where the certification in med school, for example, you're right. We don't want them going out and finding what, where is the true sense of themselves. We want them to jump through the hoops that we want that we have very clearly defined. So personalized learning is not necessarily the best thing to accommodate you or best thing to shoot for. Mm -hmm. It might be that your class lends itself towards them finding their own take on a particular thing, but it might be that you just want them to jump through the hoops as fast and efficiently, and they do too because they're gaming the system they want to get through it as soon as possible, right? So, so just, just a thing to keep in mind. I think just as a, I think the nice thing, I mean, yes, with medical students of all kinds, you want to have precise information. But the nice thing about using a form of personalized learning, even with your disciplines, is sometimes I think medicine, you can be too rigid. And there is a lot we don't know. And I think, you know, sometimes students need to think outside the, or you know, they need to be thinking more. So even if that's not what they're doing all the time, if most of the time they're just jumping through the hoops, it's good that they get that flexibility in there and realize that they might not know everything and like here's, you might have to go find resources that you aren't like just being given. And that's the problem with the way our curriculum is yeah. set up, that's what at least is like, they'll memorize it, it's gone. Like the next test is important. They have no personal connection to it. You try to give them cases that helps. They can hang it on a case. And then, um, but but ultimately, the skill set they need is not memorizing all these facts. They can look those facts up. The skill set they need is how do I problem solve? Mm -hmm. um, and you need facts, but you need to know: Do I have enough facts? And you need do to I know more know, facts. Know that those facts are accurate and true. You know, like, right, yeah. How do you how do you, how do you how do you find those? And how do you how do you learn like to to learn new information? How do you learn when your reasoning is wrong? It's taken me four years to figure out. Like, I need to tell them that. There are pitfalls in diagnostic reasoning because they will figure it out on their own. I mean, eventually, 10 years, they will. Are the facts on the test or are the problem solving? Depends, the mm -hmm. depends whose course it is. Mm -hmm. And it's usually a mixture. Yeah, um, but but one, of, so the, one of the courses I'm heavily involved in is one of the first ones they have to diagnostic reason. And we, we usually have someone fail the first semester of it because it's the first time they've really hit a really like problem based exam. And some of them really struggle to memorize it in the first few years. So, and everyone's trying to integrate, I think. I just think it's a very slow process. And it, they're like, we've integrated so much, but it's really very little. <laughs> so, we're just keeping, we're keeping in mind the uh, sort of the aspirational like, idea of personal learning. It'd be great if every student had, had like some John was saying, if every student had their own custom built, tailored educational experience. And that, you know, for, or even for five people, people that's sort of overwhelming as an instructor, much less five hundred. Um, but even just little small tweaks, asking students what they get out of the class or what they're looking for, this is a small way to make them realize that they are present in the course and they are, as an individual learner, relevant in the experience of the semester, whether it's eight weeks, whether it's 12 weeks, whether it's you know, a, a long uh, professional program, just sort of integrating those little personalized, just personal, actually, I wouldn't say personalized, just sort of personal moments of sharing and sharing between students and instructors, um, I think perhaps can go a long way. Maybe one day, You'll have these mastery paths picked out in artificial intelligence. Every... Every... <laughs> what does that mean, though? <laughs> 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 I 
instruct and they all have a job to do it. Right. Well, hopefully we can resist that. Sure. <laughs> and I There you go. So any final questions, comments, concerns about well, the coming of artificial intelligence or <laughs> I, I have a question. What questions have people asked their students that they, as from a like personalized kind of perspective, that they have found the most revealing or has given them really insightful information about their students? Because oftentimes if you say, what do you want to learn from this class? They're like, I don't know, you tell me. Yeah. Yeah, but I, yeah, I'm just wondering if any people are like, oh yeah, I asked them this question and I was like, oh, I never thought about that before. Mm -hmm. In the French department, we have a survey we did every semester, beginning of every semester. It's not, it's not what do you want to learn, what, what are your past experiences with my French. Um, and generally, it goes down the track of, you know, I had this in high school, I love the course, you know, I'm really interested in this because of that. Um, so just trying to figure out, you know, how have they, what, in what ways have they touched the subject before versus what is it you want to learn because that could be anything. I mean, AJ, who's left, and is a fun to learn anything. <laughs> It just sort of as a, a less overwhelming question, maybe. Still figure out how it's back on. Jen? I was just going to say the same thing happens with us when we ask English language learners, what do you want to learn? They always say everything. Yeah. <laughs> so it's really interesting to give them a lot of questions. So we used to give them um, a survey where we identified skills or topics in which, you know, the community was talking to or close to anything that people had every single one. So now we move to choose five, you know, prioritize. <laughs> so I don't know if that's a solution, is to you know, it's not totally open, but it's a little close where you're giving people options mm -hmm. and maybe that kind of pump or get some thinking and you've got another section where they can just fill in once they're thinking about it. Mm -hmm. I think you have to ask multiple times because the first time I asked, it's like, oh, I have no idea. But it might start climbing off, it might start saying, reflecting on the experiences that they've had with French, and then the next week we'll follow up a bit more about it because they connect with it. Today's content, and then in the week after, they connect more with today's content. So the answer to that they gave at the beginning of the semester might be remarkably different from the middle of the semester and at the end of the semester. But I think it's a process, and that process of connection is ongoing, and personalization is continual. So why make it a one-time thing? Yeah. And that makes sense because I, I mean, I think our students very rapidly lose track of why they came to right. our school so, um, because they just are trying to get through the day. Yeah. And and I'm I'm sometimes I'm like, what do you think you're going to use from this? Like, what what do you think? Why why are we doing this? And sometimes they don't have an answer. The, it's the it. culture of mindfulness is something that we've never had in education. It's always learn, learn, learn. Now why or what's the connection or stop and think about different things. But I think research is continually evolving in that area, and it's becoming more important. It's a part of the process. Well, we are unfortunately out of time. Um, if in the few minutes that you have before you need to jet off, if you could um, answer a few of these questions about you know, your impressions of the lab, what additional questions do you have about the topic, uh, we'll do our best to address those in our um, announcement for next week's lab. Um, and any additional comments and feedback you can provide, that'd be great. Um, on the way out, grab more coffee, lemonade, there's cookies left, go for it. And we hope to see you tomorrow morning. Uh, for project-based learning with the Wisconsin experience, but if not, maybe next week. And have a good afternoon. The Wisconsin-based experience, or the Wisconsin experience, is has a lot to do with personalizing learning as well. So these two topics are some ways to build out.